I am David Ridley. My guest today is Dr. William H. Carson. He's a licensed psychiatrist and former CEO of Japanese pharmaceutical company Otsuka. Dr. Carson currently serves as chair of the board of Otsuka and serves on many other boards. He's a South Carolina native. His sister attended Duke University, but he chose Harvard and then Case Western for medical school. He joined the faculty of the Medical University of South Carolina. He later joined Bristol Myers Squibb and then Otsuka. Welcome, Dr. Carson. Thank you. What differences have you seen be between Japan and the United States in terms of business culture and the pharmaceutical industry? Great question. I think that uh, from a business culture perspective, uh, people, U.S. businessmen, global business um, goes a little bit faster than what happens in Japan. So everyone needs to take their patients' pills with them when they are working with Japanese companies. Everything is slower than you might have expected it to be and much more um, complicated uh, in getting to getting across the finish line. Um, with regards to the pharmaceutical business, one of the real distinct differences, um, Japanese people in general or the older groups are very brand loyal and they stick with brands and the brands they know for quite a period of time. And so um, it's a very different, um, the sales process, especially on the pharmaceutical side, is one about building people um, into the brand versus um, some of the ways that we do in, in other parts of the globe. Good. So patience, certainly a virtue for us, especially uh, impatient Americans and uh, brand loyalty. Yes. Other thoughts on what sort of mistakes Americans make when doing business in Japan? I think the biggest mistake that most Americans have, it goes back to my patient's comment. One, it's around um, an expectation that you could fly into Tokyo, have a meeting that afternoon, have the deal and get back on the flight and go home. And I would just tell anybody that it never happens that way, ever. It just never does. Um, in fact, I would go so far if you haven't have had a meal, you don't have a deal. And it probably turns into if you haven't had meals and meals with everyone, <laughs> you don't have a deal. So um, it, it is a very, very long process. I think the other thing that I would suggest is at play um, is making sure that your concepts and ideas and proposals are very clear and that you have time to review them. Um, unlike most business situations, you could just go in and talk impromptu, the whole routine. Um, if you want to be successful with the Japanese, you should send a document beforehand for review. And you should follow up every meeting with a document that says this is what we discussed and this is what the outcomes were. And so in both instances, you give the, your, your partners on the other side an opportunity to really understand. They get to translate it into Japanese. They get to review it. And then they also get to review what you believe are the outcomes of the meeting. So I think that that kind of thoroughness really helps in interacting with our Japanese colleagues. This seems like great advice, not only for working with Japanese colleagues, but others. Provide some material in advance, follow up, great advice. But something that sounds a little bit different is, if you don't have a meal, you don't have a deal. So slow down and expect to have a meal. Expect to have a meal, expect to have a long meal. 
<laughs> expect to have a meal um, that that might make which might make you feel uncomfortable. Um, I can give you a story if you like. I um, we were working on um, getting the Abilify bipolar studies done in Japan. It was a big process because across Japan, it wasn't clear that people would be able to do the study or even believed it was necessary. So I had to visit 25 of the top psychiatrists and their hospitals um, one summer. And what I was doing was I had 10 questions that I had to send them ahead of time. And when I met with them face to face, I would go through those 10 questions. And I remember asking like, why do I have to ask the same questions? And the answer to the question was, um, you have to take responsibility for the, the conversation that you're having. And the worst case scenario is embarrassing one of the doctors by asking a question that they can't answer. So you take the responsibility for the conversation and you take the responsibility for making sure that they're prepared for the conversation with you. In that tour, um, it's late at night, we're in Hiroshima and I have dinner with a father and son psychiatrist. We had a great translator who wasn't really a translator. She was a college student. So she just told me everything they were saying versus translators editing what they tell you. And I, as she said, um, the grandfather says, you must have learned how to use chopsticks from someone from Tokyo. And I thought to myself, wow, that's very interesting because I did in fact learn how to use chopsticks from someone from Tokyo. And I answer your question with that storyline because it tells you down to even how you eat is important. This is very good advice. What are some of the challenges and opportunities of being a black CEO? I think I'll start with the challenges first. I think the challenges are the standard or the typical challenges of all black folks in this country. They're really no different. And um, I think that um, you said earlier in the introduction I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. I'll add a bit of a nuance to that. I went to segregated schools until seventh grade. So I know um, expectations or lack of expectations that the broader populace has for me and for people who look like me. Um, I would suggest that would I say that there's been a sea change since then till now? Not really. Um, I think that maybe the most interesting and typical scenario that I faced through my career was the shock and surprise when I'd walk in a room and people were like, he's black. That was all, <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, are you not reading social media or did you not look, you know, so, <laughs> and, and, but, but even with knowledge and vision and so forth, they still were very, very surprised. So I, I, I think um, that was the challenge. I think opportunities, if I were to say one of the most interesting aspects of opportunities is that um, Black folks, black professionals in general are underestimated. It doesn't take much to impress white people because they have such low expectations for you. 
It's a great story and important message, Dr. Carson, from segregated schools to CEO, and yet still a whole lot of work to be done in society. Absolutely. I, and, you know, usually, especially for students of any ilk, I almost always say that I went to segregated schools because people think of, it's like, that's way back in the distance past. It's not. And I'm 61. So if you think of everybody you know from South Carolina who's 60, white and black, we all went to segregated school. So for elementary school. So that's not that long ago. And so the challenge for all of us is yes, we've made lots of progress. Things have changed dramatically. Um, people can go to schools that they couldn't go to beforehand. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the attitudes that people held and grew up with changed. We've been talking about American society. What's, what's your experience been in Japan? Japan actually gives a door to a different way of thinking about opportunities for individuals. Um, so from a Japanese person's perspective, you and I are exactly the same. We're both not Japanese. And so from, they have no expectation, that they have no historical preference, they have no way to put a spin on it. So when it comes to being evaluated, um, it is the level playing field that all people of color, blacks, women have always asked for. So in um, my organization, when I, when I joined Otsuka in 2002, and when we first started working with them in 98, um, there have been three black CEOs um, in different parts of the organization and several women at the top of organizations too. So um, I think that instead of, uh, you, would, you would suggest that there might be a difference, but the operative aspect from a Japanese person's frame of reference is that we're not Japanese. In Japan, when you were partnering with other organizations, uh, for example, for, uh, um, CROs, clinical research organizations, what did you look for in a partner? Actually, um, I think it's at the same as you would look around the globe, maybe with one nuance different. Um, the, the use of clinical research organizations for the conduct of clinical studies um, is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, so, for example, when I joined Bristol-Myers Squibb in 1998, Bristol-Myers Squibb had never used the CRO. So, and for any of the studies. And um, then you go to a period of time where um, most many development research organizations turned their whole clinical operations over to a CRO. So, and now I think we're moving back to a place where there's a mixture between what the company does and what you outsource. So I think for Japan, it was really trying to understand um, relationships with the investigators, relationships with regards to the patients, um, understanding of the studies. Um, and as you can see, that sort of all sounds like what you do any place else in the world. Um, a bigger challenge, especially when you start to do global trials from Asia, it's trying to get everybody on the phone at the same time. So for the bipolar study again, um, for the conduct of that study over two and a half to three years, there were group meetings between Otsuka Japan, Otsuka US, the CROs and the CROs headquarters in Singapore. And we had one meeting in the morning and one meeting in the evening, um, twice a week. 
So everybody had to stay up late, get up early and stay up late um, uh, equally across the program for that period of time. So, so you have to make those kinds of accommodations, I think, when you work around the globe. What are some of the challenges of enrolling patients in clinical trials? I think that <clears throat> the biggest challenge um, is how well the clinical population under study is defined. So the more specific you can be with regards to that, the better. And I think having a very good understanding of how people are treated clinically and by whom and having relationships with those people as well. So if you've done the background work with regards to those two things, I think you have a pretty reasonable chance of recruiting um, almost any study anywhere. Um, the challenges you have with studies are um, when you may have an overlay from another authority with regards to what you're looking at. I'm thinking of a study we did with GW Pharmaceuticals, which is a botanical cannabinoid group out of the UK. And we were the first study in the US to use um, Sativex, which was a nasal um, cannabinoid, nasally ingested cannabinoid. And the FDA gave us a very strict requirement for patients. And they wanted late stage cancer patients not responsive to opioids within six months of death. All five of those patients, you need to go find them now? <laughs> well, probably the hardest part of the trial, and, 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 as you can imagine, that's a really tough criteria. And what they wanted, and doctors do such a poor job, which is determining when people might die. And we had to keep track of our patients dying within six months of joining the study. And if patients didn't stay within that range, they were concerned that the FDA was concerned that we were trying to push the use of the cannabinoid to earlier less severe patients, and they didn't want that to happen. So I think that, um, you know, that's a very specific, a very tight, a very tough population to do. We did the studies, we got them done, but it took um, that criteria added to the complexity and the time attached to doing the study. Our last segment is overrated or underrated? Okay. It's an idea I stole from Tyler Cowan. I'll uh, give you a word or phrase and you'll tell me if it's overrated or underrated and you can pass. Yes. Uh, the first is uh, overrated or underrated? The life of a CEO. Um, overrated. Why? Uh, I think that it's a great life. It's wonderful. Um, but you have a tendency to work all the time. So I, that, and I think the challenge would be, um, you have to put guardrails in around work-life balance. But everybody wants part of your time or part of you. Overrated or underrated? Practicing medicine. Um, overrated. I think that uh, medicine, I finished medical school in 85. I think being in private practice in 85 was probably a really great life. Um, being in private practice in 2020, not so much. Um, you've had the industrialized uh, growth of medicine or medicine and the industrial medicine complex. So many doctors work for big companies, big concerns. And I think that have less control over what they do, how they do it, when they do it, et cetera. And I think that, um, I think that it's a, it's a, it is definitely a challenge. I think medicine at its interaction with patients is great. I think um, how you might get paid for what you do, that may be where the challenge is. 
Overrated or underrated? Japanese trains. Underrated. Um, spectacular. I wish we had them here. Um, I would never do anything but take a train if we did. So um, always on time. You could set your clock by them. And a really fun ride. And the one thing that I would suggest for anybody is always ask them which side of the train you need to sit on to see Mount Fuji. Just a hint. <laughs> Speaking of special places, overrated or underrated? Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, Cleveland, definitely underrated. Um, I love Cleveland. I've always said, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I would go back to Cleveland at any time for almost anything. I, I, I really love the city. I didn't like the weather, but the city itself was really um, spectacular. I don't think that there's a better neighborhood in the country than Shaker Heights. I don't think that there is a better symphony hall than Severance. Um, so I think that, um, that, that there's so many things about it. the Cleveland Museum of Art. Yeah, come on. You, you can't do better than that. The last one does have a correct answer, so you've yes. been warned. <laughs> so overrated or underrated? Duke basketball. Underrated, for sure. Um, I love Coach K, and the story that I, and, and I, the reason I say that is because I remember a time my parents and I, we were at the Duke Inn or Washington Duke Inn or whatever it's called. And um, we were there and having brunch and in comes the Duke basketball team. My mother, um, my father was a, great, was a great sports fan, but my mother was really a basketball fan. And my mother ran over and she said, Coach K, Grant Hill. And they were so sweet and kind to her. And I just remember thinking, um, uh, you know, they don't know this lady from anybody and they, they treated her like she was royalty. So, um, so underrated for sure. Coach K and Grant Hill are probably Duke's two greatest ambassadors. So I'm glad your mom <laughs> got to talk to them. Yes. She barely made it above his waist. I mean, I, I didn't realize he was that tall till seeing him. <laughs> so. My guest today has been Dr. William Carson. Thanks so much, Dr. Carson. Thank you, it's been fun. <laughs>